Hello, my name is Nuno Carvalho, and today I'll be going through my answers to the 2021 AP Physics C Electricity and Magnetism uh, FRQs. This was released the day that I'm recording this, May 5th, uh, and this was the actual FRQs that were given out uh, two days ago during the first administration on May 3rd. And since I'm a student of AP Physics C Electricity and Magnetism, I took this exam myself. So I'll be going through, uh, well, what the answers should be, I would hope. Uh, unfortunately, like unlike my previous videos where they actually give out the scoring guidelines uh, for the multiple choice, they haven't released those yet for these FRQs. And so I'll be taking my best guess at what these answers are. And hopefully by showing you my reasoning and my logic, uh, hopefully they make sense. I, to me, they make sense. Uh, and But if you think that I'm wrong, if you think that some of my answers are maybe uh, incorrect or my explanation wasn't really that good, please let me know in the comments and I'll try to leave some sort of correction in the description. Uh, but yeah, please enjoy the video. FRQ number three is about magnetism. That should not be a surprise. That's usually what happens every year. Uh, but we're told that a thin conducting ring of area A and resistance R is aligned in a uniform magnetic field directed to the right and perpendicular to the plane of the ring, as shown. At time t is equal to zero, the magnitude of the magnetic field is B sub zero. And then at time is equal to one second, the magnitude of the magnetic field begins to decrease according to the equation uh, beta over T, where beta has units of, t of Tesla's time seconds. Part A, we're asked to derive an equation for the magnitude of the induced current I in the ring as a function of T for times greater than one second. Express our answers in beta, A, R, and T and physical constants as appropriate. Okay, so we are asked about the induced current, and we know that in, that a current is given by V over R, which is the same thing as EMF over R in, in these types of questions. And then we also know that EMF, induced EMF that is, is going to be given by... Uh, the change in magnetic flux over time, and we're here just taking the uh, magnitude of this. And so then what is going to be the magnetic flux? Well, it's given by this equation here, B dot dA, right? And in this scenario here, we don't have to really worry about the dot because the normal of the loop is in the same direction. It's parallel to the uh, magnetic field. So we can just simplify this to B dA, and then also it's a constant mag magnetic field, so we can just say B times A. Well, in this scenario here, uh, B A, or B I should say, is beta over T. That's given by this function here, where T is greater than one second, uh, times A. And so then, taking the derivative of this with respect to time, is going to end up being, and this is just calculus, and again I'm taking the magnitude here, is going to be beta over T squared times A like this, and this is, keep in mind, equal to the EMF, and now we just need to uh, divide this by R, the resistance, and we should get that the current is going to be given by this formula right here. For part B, we're now given values uh, for area, the resistance, and also this beta value, uh, and we're asked to calculate the electrical energy dissipated in the ring from time one second to two seconds. Well, energy dissipated uh, can be thought of as the integral of power. So that's exactly what I'm going to have here. Uh, and so then I just need to calculate what the power is going to be. And so since power can be given by this formula right here, which is really just this, I can also rewrite it as I squared over, or sorry, I squared times R, like so. And in this way, I can just use my answer from the previous uh, question and just plug it in. And so what I'll get is that power is going to be given by beta squared, area squared, over t to the power of 4, and then I have here r squared, but then I'm also multiplying by r, which means it will simplify to be that. So now I just need to take the integral of this from 1 to 2, and it's really just calculus, uh, not too complicated calculus, that is. And so I'm going to be, this is the only thing here, the only variable that actually matters, everything else is a constant, I'm going to uh, increase the power by 1, which is to say, instead of negative 4, it will be 3, and then I'm also going to divide by that negative 3, and so I'll get that it will be equal to negative beta squared a squared over, and then I'm going to have here 3, r, and then t cubed, like so, and I'm evaluating it from 1 to 2. And so I'm also going to just distribute out the negative as well, which will flip around these two uh, numbers like so, and so what I should get is beta squared a squared over 3 times r, and I'm doing 1 over 1, which is really just 1, right, minus 1 eighth. 
Okay, and so then it's just a matter of plugging everything into your calculator, in your calculator like so. And again, I would recommend you actually show your your work plugging in these values uh, because you could get points from that. And then I guess this should be 7 eighths like so. And so then the final answer that you should get should be around 0 0.00911 joules of energy. For part C, we're told that the ring is then rotated so that the plane of the ring is aligned at a 30 degree angle to the magnetic field as shown. And the magnitude of the magnetic field is reset to a magnitude of B sub zero at a new time T is equal to zero and again begins to decrease at times equal to one second according to the equation beta over T. Okay, so will the amount of energy dissipated in the ring from one to two seconds be greater than less than or equal to the energy dissipated in part B? So really we need to be thinking of these calculations that we did in the previous part, what would change given this new setup? Um, and so it sort of is a long, semi-long uh, chain of logic here, which is to say that, well, energy is going to be proportional to power, right? And we know that because we got that from the integral that we were taking. Uh, power itself is going to be uh, related to, we can say, EMF squared, and we know that from uh, this equation here. And then the EMF is going to be, well, EMF is given by the change in the magnetic flux with respect to time. And so finally, we're here, what is the magnetic flux itself? And it's B dot DA. And what changes here now is this dot product, okay? So while before we had just BA and that was it, that was our formula from before, um, we could find that all the way up here. What will change now is that because the angle is uh, different, it has changed, uh, the new angle is going to be less than, or sorry, it actually would be uh, greater than from before since we're talking about the angle between the normal and the actual uh, field here, which is to say that the cosine here will decrease, okay? Since cosine is at a maximum when theta is equal to zero, so this is the maximum. We're not at the maximum anymore. We do have an angle here. So this decreases, that means that this decreases, and since this is really just a constant on the thing that we actually uh, derive here, all right, since we're really just deriving this portion here, the T, this will also then decrease the magnitude of the EMF, which will decrease the magnitude of the power, which will decrease the energy as well. So it's going to be less than, and I'll just basically explain this whole process here in words. For part D, we've now changed our setup once again. We're now told that the ring is now mounted on an axle that's perpendicular to the magnetic field. And the magnitude of the magnetic field is now at a constant uh, B sub zero, where it's 0.5 Teslas, as shown. The ring rotates about the axle, and the EMF induced in the ring as a function of time t is shown on the graph. Calculate the angular speed uh, of the rotating disk in radians per second. Well, what I would use for this is the fact that uh, the big T here, which is supposed to be our period, is going to be given by 2 pi over omega, or the angular speed here. Uh, and so... I can look at my graph here and you can sort of think about it closely, but you can clearly see that the period goes from zero to two seconds, which is to say there's a length of two seconds for the period, okay? So that means that this is equal to two and this is in seconds, right? Which is to then say that omega here, the angular speed will be given by two pi over two. So those cancel out and we're left with uh, angular speed here of pi radians per second. And keep in mind, this is in radians because 2 pi is already give, is a value that's given already in radians. Part E, we're asked to calculate the magnitude of the maximum EMF induced in the ring. Well, for like the third time here, we're going to address this equation right here, which is that EMF is going to equal to the change in the magnetic flux with respect to time. And we know that magnetic flux is equal to uh, B dot dA. And so if you remember here, uh, we talked about how uh, now that the thing went in, in part C, that is, we rotated it. So we had to think about the cosine, uh, the cosine here of our angle. But the thing is, what is actually the angle? Well, it's going to change with respect to time, right? And you can sort of think about it a little bit more uh, closely. But what this will end up being is is going to be this. This is going to give you your um, angle here, and you can think about it as basically uh, in the same way that we think about position is going to be given by velocity times time, uh, you know, like if in a simple setup like this, then so will theta be given by 
the angular speed times time. So that's going to be our formula for the magnetic flux. And then the change in magnetic flux with respect to time, well, we're just taking the derivative of this. And what we need to remember here is we still keep these two uh, constants here. Then we are going to be deriving this. We need to pull out here the coefficient that's on the t. And then we also change this up to be sine. And in theory, I also would make this negative, but we really just care about the magnitude here of the change in magnetic flux. So this here is our EMF. And so now we're thinking, well, what's going to be the maximum of this? Well, the maximum of, of this, right? The max will be given by when the maximum of this is equal to one, right? That's, that's the maximum of any sine or cosine function is going to be one. So then that means that the max of the EMF is just going to be B sub zero times A times uh, the angular speed like so. And now plugging in our values, uh, we get 0.5. We also have 0.5 here. And then we got pi from our answer in part D. And then what you should get is that the maximum voltage is going to be 0.785 volts. Okay. And if you didn't get this part correct, like if you didn't plug in the correct value, but it was at least the value that you got from here, you should in theory still get the same amount of points. Finally, for part F, the system is changed once again. Now the ring is rotating with an angular speed of two times omega. So two times the previous angular speed. And we're asked on the graph below to draw a curve that indicates the new induced EMF in the ring. And we are given here the original EMF uh, curve that we were given in a previous problem as well. So what will actually change? Well, I think what we need to think about is that formula we came up from in the previous problem for the overall, or I guess for the EMF as a function of time, which is going to be given by this formula here. We got that from this problem right here. So let's think about what happens as we change this, okay? Uh, so as we double the omega here, then it's going to look like this, and also taking sine of two times omega times t. Uh, and so this right here, what this tells me is that we're basically going to be doubling the amplitude of all our EMF values, okay? So we should be finding that also the the maximum EMF is going to be double what it was before, and we know that because, again, here's the formula for the maximum EMF doubling the omega will double also the maximum EMF. So that makes sense. But what will also be the, the I guess, the effect of ch changing this? Well, it's going to do with the period here of our uh, sinusoidal function here. Remember that, again, period is given by this formula here, and so doubling the angular speed will half the period, okay? So the amplitude, and we can write this down here, the amplitude doubles and the period halves, okay? And so in terms of drawing, what that would look like is that we need to have a complete curve uh, finishing at this point here, and it also needs to go to double what it was originally. So maybe uh, something like this here. like that looks kind of ugly, but uh, you should be getting something that looks like that, where it's going to double the height that it was before, but also it's going twice basically as, as compressed. Okay, so again, let me finish this up, something like this, okay? And so here for justifying the sketch, uh, you'd kind of explain this idea right here. Uh, and these are two differences. In terms of similarities that you want to point out, I guess you could say they're still sinusoidally changing, the EMF is still sinusoidally changing, and also the uh, direction, I guess, has not changed, right? We go positive and then negative, positive and then negative, that has not changed either. But yeah, that's going to be this FRQ right here.